All right. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this IA webinar uh, we have organized today uh, that's going to be focusing on building a commercial market for carbon capture, utilization, and storage. My name is Araceli Fernandez. I'm the head of the Technology and Innovation Unit uh, within the Energy Technology and Policy Division at the IA. And it's my pleasure to kick off this webinar today. Uh, so I'm sure it's going to be a very informative discussion on how countries uh, can drive long-term investments in CCUS projects. But let me first of all just uh, give a couple of words in terms of housekeeping uh, aspects. Um, I think we are all very used to this uh, webinar settings by now, but please do remember to keep your microphones on mute uh, while you're not speaking. And uh, please as well, we'd like to invite you to keep your cameras off to avoid any distractions and keep the attention on the panelists that we have uh, with us today. Now, uh, just back to the topic of the, of the session, uh, let me share a couple of words of context. Um, we all know, of course, how important uh, CCUS is uh, for the global decarbonization efforts. Um, it can reduce emissions in some industrial sectors in which emissions are hard to abate, particularly when there are uh, no other scalable technology options that could be uh, applied or those are limited in uh, areas such as, for example, cement production. But also CCUS can offer a low emissions alternative for hydrogen production, which we know as well can help decarbonize uh, other parts of the energy system uh, that again uh, are difficult to electrify, for example. In addition to this, CCUS is also uh, the only technology-based solution that can enable carbon removal options. This means uh, removing CO2 uh, from the atmosphere that would be either uh, directly captured from the atmosphere indeed, or that would be indirectly uh, doing this removal effect uh, by uh, capturing and storing permanently uh, emissions that would have been emitted from bioenergy uh, sources. And in a way, this would be the only uh, tool that would allow us to do uh, to reach this net within the net zero um, goal that uh, would be uh, so required. Uh, but we are not here today to talk about you know, how uh, CCS uh, important, how important that is uh, to reach our global net zero emissions. We have had uh, long discussions on that. The idea is really to uh, organize this webinar uh, because we've seen that the industry is reaching an interesting uh, crucial point and we wanted to kind of you know get together to discuss you know what would be the priorities moving forward. Over the past three years we've seen that uh, there's been an incredible uh, momentum when it comes to project announcements along the value chain of CCUS. Uh, but at the same time and uh, now we just passed January of this year uh, we've seen how we are just uh, six years away from reaching this 1 billion tons of CO2 capture capacity that will be needed by 2030 to stay on track for uh, reaching net zero emissions by uh, 2050 at the global level. And as positive as this recent momentum is, uh, of, as of today, again, we are only 5% uh, of the way, we have reached only 5% of the way we need to be uh, to reach that goal by 2030. So the scale up needed to reach this uh, gigaton level of deployment represents a major undertaking. I think there's no doubt about that. And uh, policy support and coordination would be instrumental. So this is why we wanted really to uh, emphasize and, and have this discussion today. At the end of last year, we published a report that takes stock of existing policies that have helped uh, launch CCUS projects to date and identifies the main challenges uh, to future large scale uh, deployment. The report found that existing policies such as grants, tax credits, and enabling regulatory frameworks, while they are crucial and very important in getting these first projects moving, um, along themselves are insufficient to scale up CCUS across applications at the required pace that would be needed. As we've mentioned, we are six years, uh, just six years away so from that uh, one uh, gigaton. At the same time, Emerging business models are opening the door to new investment opportunities. And with that, shifting these risks uh, and how they are allocated across the value chain and creating uh, new challenges for policymakers uh, that need to be addressed, again, if we want to be successful. The creation of commercial market for CCUS requires a suite of policy tools to address all these challenges associated with CCUS deployment and ensuring that investment continues to flow into CCUS projects at the pace that is needed 
and that projects are completed on time as well and executed adequately. So today we have uh, had the pleasure to um, uh, have with us three excellent panelists that are going to be unpacking and providing their perspectives into these discussions and these different aspects. Um, we have with us uh, Noah Derrick uh, from the Department of Energy in the United States, also Henriette Nesheim from the Ministry of Energy in Norway, and Norihiko Seiki from the Ministry of Economy in Japan, uh, Economy, Trade and Industry in Japan, apologies. Uh, they will be sharing with us their insights and perspectives on how their respective governments are addressing these challenges and how we can, again, uh, share the risks along the supply chain of CCUS projects to advance on the pace of progress here. My colleague Carl uh, Greenfield uh, from the IA will be moderating the panel discussion, and after which we will open the floor for questions uh, from the audience as well, again, uh, to have a live discussion where we can get perspectives from all the colleagues uh, joining us. So we'll invite you please to uh, use the Q&A function in Zoom to put your questions so that we can make sure they can be addressed during the uh, panel discussion. But before going into that, I uh, just wanted to first introduce my colleague, Mathilde Haperty, uh, who will be giving us uh, more context on these uh, different challenges that governments are facing, building on the uh, analysis and the research that uh, colleagues undertook in this project uh, that uh, has been recently launched that I've mentioned. So with that, I'll just pass it over to Mathilde to proceed with the agenda. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Araceli, and good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone who joined today. Thank you for tuning in to this IBA, IA webinar. I'll just give you a quick recap of where do we need to go with CCOS and, uh, and of these tools that policymakers have at their disposal to support CCOS deployment. Um, just looking back at the past decade or so, we see that CCOS deployment has remained relatively flat. Uh, this has been partly due to a lack of policies that really drive investment and support the establishment of a commercial market for CCUS. Uh, and because of this stagnant growth, as an agency, we've progressively revised down the role that CCUS plays in our clean energy transitions from around 1.8 billion ton by 2030 in our first net zero roadmap published in 2021 to around 1 billion ton in last year's update. As you well know, 1 billion ton remains a very ambitious target, uh, which reflects two things. It reflects that CCUS still plays a key role in decarbonizing selected sectors, but also it reflects the positive momentum we've been seeing uh, in the past years. Now, as our city mentioned, this momentum alone won't take us there. To reach this 1 billion ton by 2030, we need momentum to continue, but most of all, we need projects to reach a final investment decision and commissioning. And since time is pressing, we need project lead times to be reduced. And at the sectoral level as well, we need deployment to also accelerate in sectors that are really key for net zero. Currently, over two thirds of operating capacity is on ap applications such as natural gas processing, but attention needs to be particularly placed in other applications such as industry, carbon dioxide removal, power, and hydrogen. So what needs to happen to achieve these goals? We mentioned new business models, uh, which include, for example, large CCUS hubs and networks, which represent an opportunity to help shorten need times uh, for new capture projects to connect to infrastructure, but also to reduce costs and to allow a wider range of emitters to access CCUS solutions. This is all very positive, but challenges do remain on the road to scaling up CCUS, some old and some new created by these new business models. So what can policymakers do to support deployment? The first hurdle that is very commonly faced by CCUS projects is economic viability. CCUS costs can be prohibitively high compared to unabated plants. Uh, we calculated that a carbon price between 40 to 60 for high concentration applications and between 70 to 170 per ton of CO2 for diluted applications was required for CCUS to break even with an unabated plant. This is not entirely out of reach. If we take the example of the EU, we saw EU ETS prices around $85 uh, dollar per ton in 2022, but this level, as you can see, is only sufficient to incentivize certain applications. And as we have, we've seen in the past year, carbon prices have also decreased uh, significantly since then. To level the playing field with unabated technologies, governments can First, retain cost reduction measures that have helped contribute to operational projects to date, particularly for first or second of a kind projects uh, for applications that are particularly important for net zero. Um, 
But to expand deployment, as Araceli mentioned in our introduction, more tools are needed. And in our report, we, we explore how different uh, levers like driving demand for low emissions fuels and materials through public procurement efforts and mandates, supporting high and predictable carbon pricing to send an investment signal for future CCUS projects um, to support revenue generation. And this is really what I've been has been missing so far, which can be do, done through carbon contracts for difference or a re regulated asset base model. And finally, to support emerging markets and developing economies, which is really where the majority of CCUS deployment happens in our net zero scenario. So that can be done through dedicated international funding instruments in addition to um, uh, other finance instruments, such as concessional finance, sustainable debt, et cetera. The second challenge is really to reduce lead times. Uh, if we look at operational projects to date, we can see that lead times have been, uh, or projects have taken anywhere between two to over 10 years from announcements to commissioning with a median around six years. And we have now just, just six years to reach uh, to, to 2030. So, what, what drives this lead time? Securing financing can represent a big source of delay. For operating projects, we see that reaching FID has taken on average the same time, uh, same amount of time as project construction. Uh, and securing regulatory approvals, we, are, we often hear that permitting is, a, is an important issue. And indeed, it is a time consuming step for our projects, albeit being very important, uh, particularly for storage development, uh, which requires specific exploration and injection permits. So we see hubs as an, as an opportunity to reduce these lead times for capture wishing to connect to infrastructure already in place. But there's also a risk that these first hubs take longer to develop than initial full chain projects with issues arising around value chain coordination and social acceptability around large, uh, large cost state border projects as we are currently seeing in the US. So different tools to reduce uh, lead times. Um, governments can increase the efficiency of regulatory processes and procedures and establish clear approval timelines and guidance. Data sharing is also an important part of it. Um, data sharing can help speed up project planning by making data more accessible and transparent, which can be done through data sharing requirements on companies or the governments itself uh, conducting resource assessment to identify CO2 storage sites. And finally, address social acceptability early on, for example, through a community engagement requirement in the, in the issuance of public funds for a project. The third challenge is to bridge the innovation gap. Many CCUS technologies in capture, transport, and storage have been used for decades, and may, as many um, people working in the CCUS um, field know, but the applications that are mature today are not necessarily the ones that we need for net zero. Most deployment is in industry, uh, mostly cement, but also bioenergy with CCS, uh, direct air capture, both for removal and e-fuel production, hydrogen, fossil power, uh, mainly to retrofit young coal plants in emerging economies. This is really where we see cumulative capacity to 2050. And when we look at where these technologies are today um, in terms of, of, of um, where these applications are today in terms of demonstration, we see that around three quarters of this plant capture capacity by 2050 relies on technology that are still at demonstration or prototype, or prototype scale today. So to address this gap, uh, governments can leverage rd and funding that really focuses on low tier applications. Um, and another important platform is to increase international collaboration and knowledge sharing for emerging economies, again, to uh, bridge the innovation gap in other markets. And finally, and then I, we can we can move to the panel. I wanted to address a fourth challenge, which is really these new project complexities that arise from breaking up the CCUS value chain. Um, that can include, for example, the planning of cross-border infrastructure that needs to consider regional and sectoral needs and managing access to that infrastructure. If we take the EU as an example, most CO2 storage hubs are being developed in the North Sea but many emitters, particularly waste to energy, biofuel plants, cement plants, they tend to be smaller and more dispersed in land. Um, and governments have a central role to play in coordinating the infrastructure development. So for coordination, governments can, for example, organize tenders for hubs that encourage collaboration across sectors. And that's what we've been seeing a lot in different regions to make sure capture and storage development efforts are coordinated. 
They can also create, and this is really important, an, an enabling environment for CCUS projects to remove any international barriers to cross-border transport and storage of CO2 with bilateral agreements following the London Protocol, and also clarify long-term liability and stewardship of CO2 storage sites. So this is really just a snapshot of what countries can do to support CCUS. There are many other levels, and hopefully this is a good segue for our panelists to present today um, to discuss what tools they are using in establishing commercial CCUS markets. Over to you, Carl. Thanks, Mathilde, for giving that overview. Um, as Mathilde mentioned, my name is Carl Greenfield. I work on CCUS here at the IEA. Uh, I was a co-author of the report alongside Mathilde and our other colleague, Sarah Boudinis. Um, it's clear that reaching the level of CCUS deployment needed to stay on track with net zero ambitions. It's no walk in the park. And fortunately, as you point out, Mathilde, governments have a suite of policy tools available to them uh, to help us get there. And fortunately for us today, we have a few of those governments represented here today to give us their perspectives on how their countries are working to build a commercial market for CCUS. Uh, today we have with us Noah Deitch, Senior Advisor at the U.S. Department of Energy, Henrietta Neshim, Assistant Director General at the Norway Ministry of Energy, and Norihiko Saiki, Director of CCUS Policy at the Japan Ministry of Economy, Trade, and Industry. I'll invite our, our panelists now. I see a few up there, but to, to turn on your video so we can um, get the discussion started. In just a moment, I'll pass, I'll pass it over to our panelists um, to give a few opening remarks, and after which time we'll have a, a bit of a more detailed discussion. And then we'll open it up to the audience for questions. As Araceli mentioned at the beginning, um, please use the Q&A function um, in Zoom to submit your questions at any point, Matilda and I will be monitoring the, uh, the Q&A part um, and group them into a few questions that we'll then post to the panelists uh, later on you know, with about 10 minutes left in the webinar. And now um, over to Noah to give his perspectives on the United States. Noah. Thank you, Carl. And thank you, Carl and Matilda for the invitation. And I, I first wanna start with uh, congratulations for the report. I think it's uh, very well done and incredibly important for the broader community to understand what it is going to take to actually realize the ambition that we need for carbon management and its broader role in reaching our Paris Agreement climate targets. So thank you again for uh, all of your work and, and effort on this. Where I, I wanna share why this report is, is so important and your analysis is so helpful is in the United States, we've had a step change in policy support for carbon management in the past two years. With the passage of the Inflation Reduction Act and the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which provide a twin set of subsidies for a wide range of carbon management projects. These subsidies come in the form of the 45Q tax credit, as well as uh, grant funding to the tune of around $12 billion or so over the next five years for commercial scale demonstrations of carbon management projects across the entire value chain and end use cases. And so what we are seeing in the United States today, I think is a, a real indication of, of what happens in a government funded, but industry led policy framework. And by that, I mean that we have no strong mandate for any industry to actually do carbon management. Instead, what we have is an entirely voluntary framework that offers a significant subsidies. And so our experience is in that context. We're decidedly using one arrow in the quiver um, that was identified in the report, but not creating the type of regulatory mandate that many other countries around the world are pursuing. And what we're finding is that this approach is uh, leading to some interesting early commercialization dynamics. The first of which is that there's an enormous interest in the field compared to where it was two years ago. We have seen the number of permits for geologic storage of CO2 rise over tenfold in the time frame since the passage of these two climate bills in the United States. So interest is clearly there. At the same time, we have yet to see any projects reach final investment decision um, outside of the 
high concentration sectors that tend to be the most economically profitable. And so we see very little interest in industry financing the hardest to abate and often the most expensive sectors, instead really focusing on the, the lowest cost opportunities today. And, and that makes uh, perfect sense given the subsidy is set at a flat level and does not vary depending on what type of capture source or end use we're talking about. I think the, the other key dimension here is that we are seeing significant uptake of government incentives for those hard to abate sectors. So once we do specify whether we need projects in the power sector, industry, or uh, direct air capture, we are seeing significant uptake in interest in those incentives. And so only with this combination of incentives, uh, both general for the industry, as well as specific to different end use sectors, are we seeing projects actually reach um, commercial viability. And so I think the thing that we are, are learning here in the United States is one, the power that a, a subsidy framework can provide, but also its limitations. That really subsidies coupled with a mandate that the, the need for carbon capture or, or any form of carbon management will ultimately be required is what is the most important for actually increasing the urgency and moving the entire industry quickly, as opposed to just focusing on the the high costs, uh, or sorry, the high concentration, low cost applications initially. And so we don't have a, a recommendation for what we think the optimal policy framework is. We actually think that will vary and depend based on every local uh, political context and where, where existing policies and regulations make the most sense. But we think that having that dual framework of both having the incentive as well as a long-term mandate or even the expe expectation of that is something that, that's really important. The last piece that I'll, I'll conclude on is aside from the, the incentive and or mandate framework, figuring out how to support the, the strong implementation of regulation around permitting both of the capture, transport, and storage is really important for investor confidence in these projects. Our expectation is that once investors do have confidence in applying carbon management to different end cases, that we will see uh, financing flow quite quickly into these projects. But the whole field remains new. And while projects have been getting permits um, at a, a slow pace, we expect that this having the certainty about how long the permitting process takes and having the experience working through it is something that is really important for the field overall and is not something that we think can be done without practice and trial. And so figuring out how to do that, having the, the flexibility early on to work with industry and communities to make sure that projects are implemented in a, a strong and robust way is something that's really important. Because at the end of the day, we absolutely need to have carbon management projects across a wide range of um, use cases. And then almost certainly we'll need to have carbon management projects at scale in many of the hard to abate industrial sectors like cement and in the carbon removal space uh, as well. And so figuring out how to both have a breadth of early demonstrations across these cases and then focusing resources where they're going to matter the most for climate in the long run is something that I think we have no time to wait on and uh, are eager to collaborate with, with others around the world to figure out how we can go farther and faster together on this important climate topic. So thank you all again for inviting me and back over to you, Carl. Thanks, Noah, for those insights. I think you're completely right. Faster and farther together is, is definitely how we, we start to chip away at these challenges. Um, and uh, interesting point you made also about the, um, the U.S.'s approach to building this commercial market. It's very much government-funded, industry-led, um, sort of this voluntary framework. Um, and so now this is actually sets up well for our next panelist, Henrietta uh, Neshim of, of Norway. 
Um, and I'll invite Henrietta to give a, a few introductory remarks and to hear how Norway has started to create this, um, this commercial market, really, because uh, one of the first projects starting out of Norway actually came from a bit of a heavier hand on the regulatory side. Um, so it's interesting to contrast these two countries right next to each other. Henrietta, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you very much, Carl, and thank you for the invitation to join this panel today. And I also read your report with a great interest. I think it's uh, absolutely excellent. Um, well, Norway has been quite eager on uh, CCS uh, for many years. It started early on and as an early mover on this. And we also have experience with two real projects that have been in operation for almost uh, 30 years, uh, Schleitner and Snövit, related to the uh, petroleum uh, activities. So uh, we know that this is kind of safe. They are all uh, stored offshore in Norway. So we have very good um, capacity for offshore storage due to our geological formations on the Norwegian continental shelf. So how has it developed over the years? I think it's fair to say that this has been a little bit of a roller coaster. It's been moments of high optimism. This is, can solve many things and then Nobody believes in the technology. You are kind of accused of greenwashing. And then now I think it's really, we really see a new momentum. And I think it's also because we are, it's also becoming evident that we need uh, a technology for the hard to bait sectors. And that this is very important for the, to achieve our climate uh, targets overall. Uh, and I think um, we are a small country. We, we, we really um, have always cooperated very closely with our neighbors. And we don't also have enough uh, emissions to, to fill up this storage or it, to make this a commercial market on our own. So we really have to do this together with the Europe, the EU or the, the UK and the countries around. So, but we, it's true that the, our geological potential for storage is quite uh, significant, but then it needs to also be kind of a viable model for this. So um, I think we uh, have to also uh, see that as an early mover, we choose to, uh, to try to solve some of these uh, chicken and egg problems that we always hear about, the coordination issue. So we therefore went in and supported very, um, to a large extent uh, this full chain project, the longship project where it's connected to two, um, one uh, cement uh, factory and also uh, a waste incineration project, but combined with uh, storage. Um, yeah, I will come back to that more later maybe, but uh, we are also now engaging with countries around us that they can also store there. And we have also issued over the last two years, six new exploration permits to, to see whether we can can uh, have developed new areas also for storage. So we think it's very uh, interesting time. We see much more engagement, both from the industry, from uh, those who want to develop storage and so on. So I, I think that's what I wanted to, to mention from my side, but thank you again. Look forward to the debate later. Thank you. Thanks Henrietta for those comments. Indeed, Norway has been an early mover. Um, and I think a lot of countries are looking to Norway to see how it's developing its projects, how it's developing its market. Um, so I appreciate your, your comments there, especially what you said um, about uh, CCUS being a roller coaster. Globally, we've seen this as well. It's high optimism, a bit of a lull and a renewed interest. Um, and on that renewed interest part, it's actually interesting because now we can bring in uh, Japan or Hiko Saiki, who um, just last year has made some major announcements with regards to CCUS and is um, really stepping in um, as one of those countries um, where we can see a lot of future activity um, within CCUS. So Norihiko, over to you for some initial comments. Uh, thank you very much uh, for giving me a very um, important opportunity to share uh, what we was think, what we do and what we're thinking about it. And, uh, Yes, yeah, so and actually, uh, this um, um, handbook that she shares policies and business models is, are really helpful for us to understand what is happening in the um, CCS globally. And uh, I strongly recommend you to the um, any people who would like to um, conduct a business about the CCS. 
Um, yeah, th thank you very much for uh, recording the, um, the, our uh, very basic strategy of the CCS. And uh, last year, we uh, published the CCS roadmap, long term roadmap to our materials, materialize our efforts, long term efforts. It's more than 25 years. So uh, we just uh, went through the um, two major uh, CCS demonstration projects. And, uh, and we also uh, conducting our um, R&D activities um, through uh, our um, uh, co uh, brother um, institutions, research institutions with the US and uh, Australia and the European countries and UK. And so, so um, yeah, so, this, uh, so our biggest uh, update uh, for now is just uh, we uh, got the got the, um, uh, capital determination to uh, officially propose our appeal uh, for the CCS business to the national tie-in. So we ex we expect uh, um, the cabinet is no no uh, 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 the national diet discussion will uh, happen in the uh, uh, then the next month or the next month, and we go through um, after after going through the discussion, we uh, will be um, um, uh, kind of the uh second nation to have a comprehensive uh, market mechanism based on the act and uh so um uh, we also include uh, not only the uh, so storage operator but plus operation plus the um so uh, pipeline uh, operations as well um yeah so uh, yeah thank you very much for, for sharing the the, the uh, information and the policy uh, from the we we've learned a lot from the U U.S. experience and uh, Norway's experience, so so we somehow try to catch up. Um, even at this moment, and so um, I would like to uh, add the two bullets in the page seven thirty seven uh, in the enabling legislation and rules and the regulation of industrial activities in this um, um in this box. And uh, the other thing I should mention is about um. So uh, export of the carbon dioxide. And so uh, we are currently uh, trying to uh, obtain the ruling party's permission to make a, um, uh, official uh, cabinet determination to propose to um, accept the amendment of the London Protocol, Article 6.2. And at the same time, we also um, prepare uh, the discussion with the uh, uh, countries like you know, um, so Malaysia, and then last uh, October, we uh, made the uh, MOC with the uh, Malaysian National Oil Company, the Petronas, and uh, with uh, the, the, the Japanese NOC, JOGMEC, uh, try to develop our um, perspectives about uh, how the export import mechanism will be made uh, in the context of the CCS. And we also um, uh, started to discuss the uh, so export and import mechanisms, the mechanism to be built in the through the Asia Systems Network, and we hosted um, the third meeting last year uh, with the uh, area. Area is the um, uh, Economic Research Institute for the ASEAN plus East Asia, and we was um, in this um, forum. It would be uh, one of the um, comprehensive uh approach to the uh, CCS so uh, we uh accelerating our efforts to the technology transfer of the uh analyzing of the uh so uh, potential for the any country and at the same time we also uh seeking to invest uh to uh deeper the reservoir of the um so CCS and uh at the same time the, um the many of the countries have the great many, uh, interested to uh, access the technology of the carbon capture process as well. So uh, we are trying to uh, develop uh, our comprehensive research and uh, approach uh, to those countries. And uh, and as, at the same time, we also are currently promoting our around the activities about um, uh, liquefied uh, carbon dioxide ships. Um, the, at, at this moment, currently, uh, we only have the technology at, at the scale of the 1,000 uh, uh, ton, metric ton or something. But uh, 
at this moment, we are conducting um, our research to low low pressure and low temperature uh, liquid pad ship that we developed us to develop the, from 40 to 60 metric ton, which is, which is most uh, which is almost equivalent to the air energy uh, carrier. Uh, so I think the um, in that case, I think the, the Asian countries like us and South Korea and Taiwan and uh, uh, Singapore uh, can prom can export the carbon dioxide at a, a commercial scale level. So th that will be the one of the most um, um, efficient and plus uh, very important uh, measures to uh, materialize it uh, to develop the international market of the carbon dioxide trade. Um, regarding this, regarding the cost, I think this cost is still issue for the, any country to de uh, deploy the, the CCS uh, system. But uh, when it comes to the onshore uh, uh, CCS project, our scale is expected, expects the, it would be um, around uh, uh, from $85 to the $100 at this moment. So per, per ton, metric ton. So, so I think that will be, almost uh, equivalent to the um, uh, carbon pricing in the European countries. Uh, at this moment, in, in Japan, there is no uh, specific um, carbon pricing at this moment, but uh, we will also discuss the um, so our establishment of the um, legal-based um, uh, carbon uh, trading system as well. So in that case, I think the, the, that um, the carbon pricing uh, will also be the one of the important uh, uh, incentives for the uh, private sectors as well. So um, we are currently promoting the uh, the discussion about uh, uh, OPEX support, and uh, as as the uh, as you may know, and we uh, launched the um, so advanced CCS program to select the seven projects, including two. Uh, international projects, and uh, currently we are discussing how to um, uh, ensure the commercial commercial operations of the CCS. So uh, we planned and we researched a lot, uh, but I think there is no absolute goal or absolute consensus the how to support the financially. But uh, our tentative um, analysis shows that. Uh, there's a certain combination of the support mechanism is needed to facilitate uh, um, enabling the commercial act, commercial operation. So number one is the grant. Number two is the credit system. Number three is the tax incentives as well. So so I think that there's a, a combination needed. So uh, we are currently initiate the discussion uh, to uh, how to uh, commercially operation commercial operation of the CCS business. Um, yeah, so, so actually uh, we recognize that we are a little bit delayed uh, compared to the US and the European experiences, so we would like to know more about it. So uh, uh, please collaborate with us. And of course, um, there's other um, potential uh, customers about the, uh, about the deep, um, as a collaboration, uh, uh, collaboration about the deploying the more and more issues capacities. So uh, we also would like to seek the tra technology transfer opportunity for those countries. Thank you very much. Uh, back over to you, Carl. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norihiko, for those comments. Um, I think you're, you're very much right. A combination of support mechanisms are needed. This is something we outline as well in our report. And it's interesting to see Japan start to develop its um, its policy structure and incentive structure, taking a little bit of lessons learned from the United States, for instance, from Europe, from Norway, um, from different countries around the world. Um, uh, so with that, actually, we'll, um, we'll start a little bit more of a detailed discussion between the panelists. Um, there's something that we've been thinking about here at the IEA for the last year and a half, almost two years now. Um, and that has to do with lead times. So as Mathilde pointed out in her presentation, it takes around six years on average for a CCUS project to get up and running. Um, these long lead times put the world at risk of reaching the level of deployment needed to stay on track with net zero. Um, so I'm curious to hear from the panelists, what, what, are, what can governments do to reduce some of these project lead times? 
Uh, and what extra steps could the private sector be taking uh, to move projects into operation? I think uh, first we'll start with uh, with Noah, um, mainly because Noah, you you called it out in your opening remarks, um, saying that regulatory support around permitting um, is really key to enable uh, investor confidence in in projects as well. So Noah, um, we'll start with you, and then um, Henriette and Norhiko, feel free to chime in afterwards. Yeah, thanks, Carl. And while these projects have taken a long time to develop in the past, we do not believe that that's a fundamental feature of these projects. We think they can be developed in a much shorter timeline um, in the future if the incentives are aligned to do so. And I think here in the US, we're trying to do that through um, coordinating all of the different regulatory pieces. We have uh, a legislation called the FAST 41 legislation that enables developers that have to apply for multiple permits to do so in a coordinated fashion with a, a commitment to doing so in, in less than two years for the full range of carbon management projects. So we we recognize this is something that is really important and understand that permitting piece is um, essential. At the same time, it's going to take that industry leadership both to uh, support this with a, a little bit more transparency early on um, on the data sharing, not just with uh, government and, and other um, financial or industry stakeholders, but making sure that the community is uh, engaged and really bought in from the beginning. We have seen this be one of the key barriers in the United States context, but we also see that many communities are very excited about carbon management projects. So figuring out where to do these projects and then also how to provide benefits to those industries so that they are directly being supported by the economic um, opportunity from these projects and making sure that any environmental impacts are mitigated is something that's really important uh, to make sure that these projects can move more swiftly. Thanks, Noah, for, for those comments. Um, Henrietta or Norahiko, do you have anything to add on this? Yes. Um... I think that overall, we just have also have to acknowledge that large scale uh, uh, infrastructure on energy, it is time consuming to develop and it has long lead times. And if you look at, for instance, uh, cross border electricity grids, I think the average is 10 years. Not uh, that puts apart. I think, of course, um, we should encourage governments to have a speedier process on permitting. But at the same time, we need to keep in mind that these processes are also there for good reasons and often they it takes time with timelines for public consultations and so on and public hearings and it's very important also to have very good processes that take into account environmental concerns because if the necessary steps are not taken early on well this can also impact public perception of ccs if something goes uh, wrong uh, and impact it in a negative way we see for instance at the moment we experience high public resistance against uh, offshore wind, now onshore wind, for instance, and on grids in general. So we really would like to avoid something go wrong on the CCI side. But it's true that also what has been mentioned here, that the regulatory framework and commercial conditions, they are uh, oftentimes developed in parallel as the projects, because this is kind of a new activity. So, um, and we also see that by all the national strategies on CCS that are developed uh, these days. So I think we, um, as the government, we can always alleviate some of the risk of the project, whether it's on uh, funding or whether it's on, on the, <clears throat> the regulatory aspects. I think that also, if you look at it from the private uh, sector, uh, uh, sector point of view, these are very hard. Uh, some of these projects are very, very big, so they would also need time. The, the more costly a project is, the more solid analysis and works need to be put in place to have to also provide the right permits and to to applicate have the permit applications, but also for their own to be able to take the next steps in the in decision making. So and also. Uh, as the projects mature, new technological aspect may pop up and then they have to be handled. <clears throat> this is at least what we have experience from. But I just also want to emphasize that there is a need for uh, collaboration between industries 
and also to develop uh, trust uh, and partnerships all along. So I think that also I, I share Noah's view that I think that the lead times will be reduced over time as we gain more experience and that the projects become more standardized. Thank you. Thanks, Henrietta. Um, and of course, we also appreciate your comments too on need, the need to maintain um, sort of the environmental integrity, but also the social integrity of uh, projects during the permitting process. Um, Norihiko? Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, so the CCS market is still pretty much pretty mature at this moment, and so there's no as um, existing the pipelines, and uh, uh, there's no uh, there's limited players uh, of the operators and uh, at the same time the users. So um, unfortunately, we have uh, um, every knowledge, all of them knowledge about what would happen in the market activities of the CCS. So at this moment, we would like to gap. We would come up the uh, cover the gap, and we do like to increase the communication among the uh, those players. So, um, so we are usually have a monthly meeting of the, the all the, all of those um market players and try to understand that their um um their how how, how the the risk will arise and uh, how to cover the potential risks. So, so um yeah, I think the this is the the, the the nature of the or the or the maybe the steps of the ma market is still premature. So the, the, that'll be the one who was, uh, was our hit day at this moment. And um, of course, um, um, there's a certain mechanism based on the um, the regulatory schemes will uh, support the business. So uh, there's a certain mechanism to to provide the exclusive right to a certain exploration and operation. But uh, then of course um, um, the grant system is also um, covers the potential threats, and so. Um, but we are still learning at this moment. So, so um, yeah. So we 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 learn other things, and uh, and not, not only uh, the headaches from the Japanese companies, but also uh, we also access to the the foreign counterparts, and I try to understand what happened. So and the communication is uh, is you know, is very important at this moment. Can completely agree on that, and um, and actually, I think the Tomokomai project in Japan is an excellent case and a success of that early onset communication of of a project. Um, so th thank you all for those comments. Um, maybe I'll ask one more question to the panelists, and then we can open it up to the the questions from the audience. So. Um, Again, uh, please feel free to use the Q&A part of the, the Zoom call. Um, this, this question is, is geared more towards Henrietta and Norihiko specifically. Um, Noah, feel free to chime in as well. But um, it's, it's really because we start to see Norway and Japan look beyond their borders um, for CCUS projects. Uh, Norihiko, you mentioned this in your comments in terms of exporting CO2. Um, and of course, Norway having um, more storage availability than they have emissions. Um, it's a natural uh, business model to import CO2. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see what kind of challenges that you two are seeing in developing these cross-border projects and what words of advice could you give to countries who are considering developing these projects? Uh, maybe we'll start with Henrietta first. Thank you, Carl. Um, well, the coordination issue along the um, value chain uh, that is, of course, amplified uh, cross-border. But I think that my best advice would be to remain patient and pragmatic and to continue to build uh, trust and cooperation in a long-term perspective, both at industry level as well as uh, government level. So in Europe, the EU EEA legislation facilitates uh, cross-border cooperation as the, we have kind of a common uh, regulatory framework and it's already in place and under development. And it, for instance, through the ETS system with a carbon price and also the CCS directive. So we have kind of the same regulatory framework. But um, so this uh, facilitates a lot. Then you have the IMO that you have to uh, implement in order to be able to transport cross borders. So the countries involved need to have implemented the, the IMO uh, amendments. Uh, also mentioned by Noriko, but I can see, say also that 
from what I said on the public perception note, I think that there may be a challenge uh, going forward as related to questions on why should one country receive the CO2 from other countries for storage and what would the risk be of that in a long-term perspective. But apart from that, I think uh, the I think that's the main challenge cross border. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, yeah, this is very this is very also very fundamental um, question to cover the um, so residual emission in Asia, and so we are kind we are uh, repeated the importance of the including the transboundary trans uh, CCS in Asia. Uh, I think I I would like to uh, uh, talk about the three things, uh, three challenges uh, to cover, and. Uh, yeah, so we respect the uh, European experiences, and we also uh, feel envy, even envy uh, the the systems of the uh, European countries, uh, because there's a uh, uh, the, actually the European has the CCS directive, and uh, so uh, there's a certain consensus about the regulation So, and uh, the other thing is also very important. The ETS system is also very critically important. So um, um, when it comes to the so um, consent, uh, uh, agreement or arrangement between the nations, I think that it's rather very simple. But when it comes to the uh, European uh, the, uh, Asian countries, there's no consensus about the regulation. So, and uh, there's a certain um, so um, tradition of the practices about uh, from the uh, so oil and the gas activities. So, so I think there's sometimes um, um, so the level of the regulation is, is diversified. So, so uh, we, the Japan is a member country of the so London Protocol. So we need to somehow request the uh, Asian countries to come up with the, the regulation level, which is equivalent to the London Protocol requirements. That, that is also, uh, that, that is a, the first Hitting for us, and listen. The other thing I need to uh, mention is about uh, uh, the regulation. You see, um, so um, ex lack of the ex experiences that operate. No, not, not only for the uh, so in the industrial sectors, but also we also um, request um, so um, the ministers of the regulatory bodies to um, learn and uh, get their own the experiences to operate the regulation. So, so. So we are currently seeking to um, the, uh, building a certain opportunities to for the uh, um, the staffs and uh, uh, members of the regulatory bodies of the um, those uh, regulation uh, of the CCS reservoir operation. So and and at, at the same time, um, 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 there's no certain supporting mechanism for the emitters to uh, provide an, uh, 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 the carbon dioxide. And so, um, for the most part, I think that around the 2030 or 2040, uh, I think there's a limited uh, um, emitters or emitter countries uh, can only uh, export our carbon dioxide uh, to the, those um, the reservoir, uh, and 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 and, and uh, um, that 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 is a um, that's a certain condition to uh, go, uh, uh, operate. The reservoir commercially uh, in those um, ASEAN countries. So um, yeah, for, for the exporting countries like us and the South Korea and the Taiwan, I think they can support the, as the government to support to the emitters. The wizard, I think the, 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 the little, little numbers of the, the money can support the emitters, uh, those um, ASEAN countries and the companies. And the last one is the investment. So uh, for the developing the reservoir, so what we are um, requesting the um, the national diet to uh, add the function to uh, invest uh, the reservoir development uh, to the our uh, NOC of the job map. So so I think there are a lot of a lot of things, but uh, without it, I think the regional um, so uh, carbon neutrality cannot be accomplished in Asian countries. So we can do everything what we can do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Norhiko, for outlining those those three important points. Um, and thanks to the uh, folks in the audience who are submitting their questions. Um, recognizing time, um, I'll try to wordsmith a few of the questions into one overarching question for our panelists here. 
Um, we had one question come in about um, kind of the hard to abate industry, industry sector. Um, and we had another question come in about the um, really what's a commercial market and kind of looking more at the long term, um, the long term view of CCUS. Um, and so in, in a, a botched effort to try to combine these two together, um, I'll start with Noah. Um, but I'm, I'm curious to hear how the U.S. is approaching um, some of the um, the hard to abate sectors, incentivizing um, capture and hard to abate sectors. Um, really more long term, um, how do you see the development of this quote unquote commercial market for CCUS um, tax credits, grants in perpetuity or in a different way? Over to you. Yeah, so I, I think answering that second question first, this is fundamentally pollution control. It, carbon management does not create energy. So we have to think about this as how do we incentivize that waste management activity, which this fundamentally is. That's going to require some sort of government intervention, whether it's subsidies, regulations, combination of the two. It doesn't really matter in the long run as long as it happens. And so there are plenty of commercial waste management or pollution control markets. All of them have some form of government intervention. And that's really why our strategy in the near term at the Department of Energy and really in the U.S. is focused on optionality. We're not entirely sure how fast alternatives for carbon management on the decarbonization front are going to emerge. We're investing heavily to make sure that they do emerge as quickly as they can. So electrification, fuel switching, um, other types of uh, approaches. But at the same time, we need to have carbon management as a backstop in some of the events that those solutions face headwinds that are, are unexpected or are expected and we can't overcome them as quickly as we needed. And at the same time, there are other solutions where replacements are just decades away from commercial maturity. And so we need carbon management in those at scale quickly. And so that's really how we're thinking about that, both on the breadth of use cases to, to demonstrate and have that optionality, but focusing today in the, the areas where there are the fewest replacements today that really matter the most for climate. Thanks, Noah. And over to Norihiko and then Henrietta afterwards. Norihiko, if you have any um, comments on sort of the, the longer term um, vision for, for CCUS, I know that the, um, the plan that Japan has laid out is really focused sort of the near term, but looking more long term and then um, even how you're, you're starting to address some of those um, uh, some of those harder to hit uh, sectors as well. Oh, th thank you very much. Uh, I mistook uh, that, that that I muted. So <laughs> but, um, it's it's already I'm I'm muted. So so um, yeah, yeah. I think the long term um, thoughts on the um, so uh, the commitment toward the co uh, carbon management is very critical and important. So uh, actually, in our uh, advanced issues program, we. Uh, we have already selected um, um, the target industry uh, as a as a how to abate industry. So, so um, uh, generally speaking, we are um, installed the CCS um, in the power sector and the oil refinery and uh, um, steel and the cement and uh, power paper paper industry. So, so um, uh, we we set the goal and at the same time we facilitate the communication. And uh, we would like to somehow obtain the certain commitment from those uh, industries. So, so I think the so Japan's Japan's practice is based on the communication between the uh, uh, government to the industry. So, uh, by doing so, we somehow try to um, uh, program our the important their requirement and that they were request uh, into our grant system. So, so. Um, yeah, of course. Um, um, so our, our, our monetary based um, incentives is very critical, and then and the regulatory uh, based um, incentives are also very important. But uh, in, in Japan, we are somehow trying to communicate and uh, the obtain their uh, confidence about uh, using utilizing the CCS or other other means to accomplish the carbon neutrality. And uh, yeah, so um, and the communication is very important for us. Thank you, Norihiko. Hen Henrietta? 
Yes, uh, no, I agree that the, the CO2 management, the CO2 in this uh, sense is not like any other commodity since it's for kind of storage eternal. Mm -hmm. But we like to think of this as a decarbonization service. And we believe that this can be, that the willingness to pay for this service will is likely to increase as the ETS price is expected to increase for the industry. So in that sense, um, yeah, it's it's very good. We you have it as a, a climate mitigation tool, but we we also believe that this can be a commercial activity on its own, especially for Norway. Thanks. Thank you very much for those comments, um, and a big thank you to our our three panelists here, as well as to to those who um, uh, participated in the chat function. Um, I'll pass it over to Araceli for a few closing remarks. Thank you very much, Carla, and to all the panelists indeed. Um, so we've just been hearing uh, policymakers have at their disposal a suite of tools to facilitate and promote the deployment of CCUS projects, which is very encouraging. Experience has shown that uh, layering or stacking various policies across the CCUS value chain can help address these different risks uh, that a project may face. And so it's important that policies work uh, to set up a viable and sustainable commercial market for CCUS that attracts investment and retains it over uh, the long term as well. Um, ultimately, governments will need to assess the level of risk they are willing to take on. And so in some cases, this may mean taking on a greater level of risk in the early stages, ensuring that first mover projects have their financing and support needed to start operations. In other cases, this may mean that the governments plays a matchmaking role, coordinating the deployment of projects across the value chain. But in any case, governments uh, may choose to shift their risk appetite as the CCUS market develops as well. So this is a very dynamic environment and will be, uh, again, very important to ensure that we share best practices in this space. One point was clear to me, uh, building a commercial market for CCUS is not an easy task. And, and so there's no one size fits all approach here. Uh, again, that's why it's so important to have this type of gatherings and exchanges and making sure that we can leverage on best practices across different regions. Creating such a market uh, requires addressing multiple economic uh, lead time, innovation, complexity, complexity challenges. However, these challenges are not unsurmountable uh, and overcoming them is entirely possible with the right policy environment and investments uh, from the industry. So now is not the time to slow down, it's rather to make sure that with this recent momentum on CCUS, uh, that we've seen, uh, this can really show us that there is a strong interest from commentaries and companies in advancing CCUS. And so again, sharing lesson learns and experiences like we heard from today can help us uh, ensure progress is, uh, is really shared. Uh, raising international ambition can play a key role here. And so the recently launched Carbon Management Challenge, for example, which brings uh, together 19 countries, including the three represented here today and the European Commission, is a step in the right direction to raising global ambition. And so for CCUS to play its role in the decarbonization portfolio, the next step is to capitalize on this ambition and, and really deliver. So uh, with that, I'd, I'd like to really conclude the, the interesting session. Uh, again, just big thanks from my side to the excellent panelists today, to Noah, Henriette, and Norihiko, but also to all of the ones that, uh, I mean, great experts were joining us as well remotely. And uh, thanks very much for uh, staying with us and, and to ask these questions. But a final big thanks from my side as well to the great IA team behind the analysis for not just that report, but also organizing this uh, great uh, discussion. So thanks very much, everyone. Let's keep in touch and uh, yeah, have a great day.